Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Story Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, a power struggle within the Utah Republican Party shows deep divisions. How will the new bylaws affect this year's elections? Will they lead to another lawsuit? And what does all this mean for the future of the Republican Party in Utah? State lawmakers near the end of the legislative session with most of the controversial issues still on the table. With hundreds of bills still under consideration, how will these end of game decisions impact Utahns? In DC, Congress is back in session and debating tough issues like gun control. What, if any, reforms will we see? Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Dennis Romboy, political reporter for the Deseret News, Michelle Quist, columnist for the Salt Lake Tribune, and Glenn Mills, reporter for ABC4 Utah. Thank you for being with us today. There's a lot to get to, so let's jump right in. Michelle, we're going to start with you, okay? Sure. Dysfunction in the GOP. We talked about this on the show last week, but a lot has happened since then. The Central Committee has decided how one gets on the ballot as a Republican. Tell us what they did on Saturday, and then let's talk about the ramifications. So they passed a bylaw that says that if you are a candidate for an office and you choose the signature route, whether it's signature route only or signature and convention, then you automatically um, disqualify yourself from membership in the party. And what they're doing is they're trying to set up a legal case, another one, before the one that is pending mm. is resolved in the Tenth Circuit. They're, they want to set up another one, this perfect scenario to go and still argue the idea that as a private party, they have the right to decide how their candidates are make it to the general election. Mm -hmm. And the bylaw only applies to the first and second congressional districts That's right. at this point. And, so and there's why, no candidate there's no candidate signed up to, to gather signatures. Except there is someone jumping in just in a jest type of fashion. Uh, Jeremy Roberts has launch the campaign and he's just doing it to prove a point. Right. He's not really going in to seriously take on Chris Stewart. He wants to go gather signatures and force Chairman Anderson to make a decision on what happens. Mm -hmm. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays as well. Can it at some, uh, at some point if he decides to, to pursue that and, and they need it, someone to have as a plaintiff, they could they could mm -hmm. pursue a lawsuit. And my way. understanding of the uh, law, bylaw as well is that it just applies to the two seats in 2018, but then to all seats in 2020. So then it's going forward. What, what was the rationale, Dennis, on saying first and second? I, I think that they, they don't okay. want to disrupt uh, yeah. Mitt Romney's campaign or the other two congressional districts where candidates have already signed up to gather signatures. They didn't want to disrupt any candidates who had already signed up. And mm -hmm. for some reason, in the first and second, there weren't any signature candidates mm -hmm. that had signed they just up hadn't yet. De declared yet. Right. So you've been following, Michelle, the State Central Committee for a very long time. Right. Is the whole goal of this in your mind to get this lawsuit, or yes. is this really their effort to completely restrict who gets on the ballot through their through their efforts? They want to set up another lawsuit so that they can restrict the sig signature gathering candidates. They do not want signature gathering candidates. I so, think they'd rather eliminate signature gathering altogether. Yes. So it just goes back to the mm -hmm. old caucus and convention system, and, and they don't have that option anymore to, to do away with SB 54. That's what the minority group yeah. wants. Right, right. right. And, the risk they're running is potentially losing the caucus system altogether. In fact, uh, Senator Bramble in his availability just the other day mentioned what happened on Saturday could eventually lead to losing the caucus system altogether. Well, and the irony in all of this, too, is that it, it, they're a qualified political party currently. If their status becomes registered political party, there's only one path to the ballot, and that is gathering signatures. Okay, I think we need to explain what those two categories mean, because that's what the law has set up, right? So tell us, tell us the, t the difference between those two, because the GOP right now is a qualified political party. So basically a qualified political party means that you've agreed to allow candidates to go through the convention system to be nominated to get on a mm -hmm. primary ballot, or they can gather signatures to get on the primary ballot. If you're a registered political party, the only path to the ballot is to gather signatures. And the thresholds are a little different. And the thresholds are a little different as, as to the number of signatures you right. have to gather. For a registered party, you only need 2% of mm -hmm. 
of, mm -hmm. of, of the party. And, and in the other ones, you know, like you could need 28,000 for, for a Senate candidacy. Okay. So, so take us down this path well, for a moment. And that's the interesting thing. The Republican Party has already chosen to be mm -hmm. a QPP party. And Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox doesn't have a mechanism to, to take that away from them right now. That's what perhaps Senator Bramble and, and this legislation that might come out in the next week you know, may decide to do is that if a party doesn't somehow in their bylaws allow what the law says a QPP is supposed to be, then they default to a registered political party. But right now there is no default. So, so mm -hmm. Spencer right. Cox has no mechanism to, to to you know to boot them out so I think that he would just allow the candidates on the ballot and the party would be the one who would have to sue the state. Mm -hmm. And well, there he, are, he said he's, everyone that's that's running now is going to be on the ballot. Yeah. Right. He has to following the law. But, but there is I mean they are working pretty seriously on a legislative fix. Um, Representative Mike McKell opened a bill file. I saw uh, Senator Bramble going into the governor's office yesterday so they're really talking about this and looking at how they can uh, close the loophole and trying to get that done before before the session closes. They're trying to get to this. What happens if the registered political party, Glenn, is what is left for some of these candidates? That's the weird hole we're talking about, right? right. So let's just say they're not a qualified political party, they're a registered political party. So what happens to those candidates that are trying to get on the ballot? Well, that's the uncertainty at this point, and that's what uh, Lieutenant Governor Cox address is that right now, with all this back and forth, and by the way, I want to mention, from a media perspective, this is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> uh, as the GLP turns, we could call this, uh, and that's basically what this boils down to, just this infighting. But it's just that uncertainty for a candidate not knowing how they're going to be able to get on the ballot, if they'll be able to get on the ballot, if they'll even be, you know, what party they'll even be into. So there's just a lot of uncertainty surrounding that question right mm -hmm. now. So one final thing on that point for the potential legislation, because some candidates that were not going to get signatures, they were just going to the convention process. Where are they now, Michelle, on this one if they decided not to get signatures at all? I think they're still on the path to the convention. I don't think that convention will be uh, deleted yet. I think that Spencer Cox is going to just have things go as normal. The only thing that could could halt, halt it is would be a court, a, a, an injunction from a court, and I don't see that happening quick. But there's still some candidates that are fundamentally opposed to gathering signatures, and they're, I think they're in a real dilemma as to what do I do? Do I try to this convention route? Is it going to be available, or do I have to resort to gathering signatures when I really don't want to and I don't believe? that that, that uh, should should be an option. Mm -hmm. And most are opting to go ahead and gather signatures having no idea what could potentially happen at convention. Okay, yeah. the, the last question on this, Glenn, I know you've talked to the Lieutenant Governor's office at length about this. What is uh, Lieutenant Governor Cox going to do right now? What is his strategy with these lawsuits that may be coming from mm -hmm. any direction? Well, right now his strategy is to move forward with the law as he sees it. That being there's a dual path under state law to let us uh, candidates get on the the ballot and that's how he's going to move forward at this mm -hmm. point. Could they extend the time period for getting signatures for some of these candidates that may be in limbo? They could. The, the legislature would probably be upset about it again yeah. <laughs> that they're messing with the deadlines without mm -hmm. a legislative fix. One thing I think is really important to mention in in this uh, story as well is just the sheer divide that we're seeing within the Republican Party. This is a civil war within the Republican Party and it's interesting because you know Governor Herbert yesterday mentioned, you know, they may think that they're moving in the right direction, what's best for the party, but he said overall, you know, it's really having a detrimental effect. That's not his exact words, but that's what he was saying on the party. You talk with, um, you know, more moderate members of the party, and they are fed up with this. Oh, for sure. And it's just going to be really interesting to see how this moves forward. And another point I want to make, when Rob Anderson ran for chair, this issue was what that race was centered around at that convention. He made it clear he wants out of the SB 54 lawsuit, he wants to get resolution, and his opponent was who? It was Phil Wright, who is you know, front and center mm -hmm. it, with this uh, central committee. And it was very clear the paths that both of them were going to take and even the delegates sided with Anderson mm -hmm. at the time and wanted to move forward with his vision. Well, in, in this minority group, they want repeal of SB 54, but what they're forcing is no, sig you know, only signatures. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what they're forcing. That's what an, a registered party would be. Which is the irony in, in right. the whole thing. Yeah. Of course. That's and true. another irony we might want to touch base on that's interesting are these opposing ballot initiatives. Mm 
going for one to preserve the caucus system one to preserve the dual pass system i mean we're in a sit talk about the uncertainty we're in a situation with that one where you can have dueling ballot initiatives mm -hmm. on the ballot both of them pass and then what do you do with, lo with lawsuits in the mix. Meantime, the Democrats are laughing all the way through yeah. this whole thing. Yeah, this, is totally, this is amusing to them. Uh, it's amusing to us, actually, too, but they, uh, they're getting a big kick out mm -hmm. of watching the Republicans kind of self-destruct here. Okay. We'll keep following that one on the show. Let's talk about some things happening with our legislature right now. Some bills are coming forward. An interesting new commission started yesterday aimed at addressing issues with gun violence in the state and in the country. This is called the Utah Safety Commission. Michelle, let's start with you. Describe what this is intended to do and a little bit of the makeup. Well, you know, I love that Speaker Hughes is being so aggressive with combating this issue, with saying, yes, we only have a week left in the session, but we need to get something done. So, you know, he, he brought together stakeholders that can make a difference mm -hmm. in schools and, and look at, you know, are we, are we, do we need better gun locks? I mean, uh, door locks on the doors. Do we need, um, you know, more marshals? You know, what do we need to make a difference in the schools? I think that, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be great. Okay. What is the commission supposed to do, Dennis? I think the commission is supposed to look, all options are on the table, according mm -hmm. to lawmakers, to look at some of these things that Michelle just mentioned. Um, what options do they have to make schools safe? Is it patrols? Is it, I, I don't know, the arming teachers is on the table, but they said everything's on the table, mm -hmm. you know. I, so it's, they're looking at a variety of options and trying to come up with some recommendations that they can bring back to lawmakers uh, before the school year starts, yeah. as I understand it. So. Yeah, Go ahead, just Glenn. one point, uh, in Utah, teachers can already carry concealed if they want to. Right. Um, but yeah, we're probably looking at a special session before any of these recommendations from the commission could be uh, dealt with and addressed. However, there's one bill on the table right now that they think they can go ahead and get through. That is Representative Steve Handy's. Mm -hmm. It's the Extreme Risk Protective Order Bill. Basically what it would do through due process is set up a, a court process in which if all the signs are there, like what we saw with the Florida shooter, you know, more than 20 calls going into law enforcement or possibly even 40, the number, the number is, is uh, in question depending on who you ask. But if there's a situation like that, a court approved process to go in and remove the guns from that individual mm -hmm. and then they go through a treatment uh, time period up to two weeks where they're reevaluated. So that's one thing they feel good about getting through the legislative session before mm -hmm. it ends next week. So maybe you can help me answer, what, what triggers a protective order? What Under what circumstances could they obtain that protective order? Well, under, from my understanding, obviously it's the extreme, extreme risk, but that is if they have reason to believe all the red flag signs are there. You know, if people are calling in, for example, in Florida, you know, we have reports of this guy, you know, saying on YouTube, I'm going to be a famous school shooter, uh, things like that. If people are highly concerned about an individual, whether it's someone at school, like a teacher or a parent or a relative or a friend, and they have those concerns, they can then petition the court for that. I think mm -hmm. domestic violence issues are That's part of that as well. Domestic yeah. violence they are, part of that as well. Indeed. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about this is that bill and what you were just mentioning, Dennis, in terms of what this commission can do, those were not exactly restrictions on guns you were just talking about. Are these are these gun bills? Are these, what, what are, are these then? Th this one is because it allows, it allows the government to go in and seize the gun temporarily, mm -hmm. and that's gun you know, and that's a gun control. So, so that might be one they're, of them. They're right. gun bills, but don't call it a gun I bill. I think right? legislators, no, no. legislators yes, are a little right. hinky about calling them right. gun bills. Yeah. They want to call them safe school bills right. or school or safety public bills. Safety public bills. safety bills. Because like uh, that. Handy, yeah, right. yesterday, Handy yesterday at the press conference went on to say it's not a gun bill per se. It's more of a public safety public health issue. Mm -hmm. So what do you make of yeah, this yeah. this dialogue between the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate? Because you mentioned the Speaker's ready to yeah. jump in. It's time for us to go now. President Niederhauser is taking a little more of a, a, a measured look at this, mm -hmm. saying this is something that superintendents and the school district should talk about. Why is he taking that line, do you think, Michelle? Um, I think he wants to make sure that stakeholders are are in, you know, are, are, mm -hmm. are vested in the in what's going on, um, whereas Speaker Hughes, this is his last, you know, his last session. He wants to get stuff done. Yeah. Well, let's let's tie this to this dysfunction that Glenn was talking about in the party, because Republicans nationally on these issues are not completely in sync either. With the President of the United States saying, "You all are just afraid of the NRA." What do you make of that, Glenn? That's not something you hear every day from Republican well, president. kind of having flashbacks to the dreamers in the immigration debate, right? Where President Trump uh, started to side with Democrats and 
in the end, we saw it more of a negotiation tool. I think we're probably seeing a repeat of that in this situation where he's taking a hard line, uh, bringing in the Democrats and, and you know being on their side. Yeah. Even they were skeptical from what I saw from the meeting yesterday. So it could just be another negotiation tool. What do you think, Dennis? It sounds it could be a ploy. I think he's trying to go the Republicans into to acting and doing something, and he he's shown that's that's how he operates. He's done this before on on those issues, and and I wouldn't be surprised if it's just a, a way to uh, to try to move Republicans to do something. Mm -hmm. I think that's generous. I think he doesn't always act meaning meaningfully, and you know sometimes he just spouts off things that he says. You know, when you have a president saying we'll worry about the Second Amendment later, it's it's you know, did mm -hmm. you really mean to say that? Well, so that's a little bit interesting because Glenn was talking about the due process and Michelle, you were for the, the current Utah bill that might be on the table. Right. But what he was talking about, the President of the United States, that's kind of different. Yeah. That's due process after the takeaway. Right. Was that just a posturing or is that just like a mistake? Maybe you didn't understand that. I would part. say a little well, and I, After thinking about that, yeah, I would agree that, that yeah, he just tends to spout off and then uh, and tries to repair it, it later. Yeah, and yeah. Like, oh, it, wait. Yeah, exactly. Well, an interesting <laughs> note is uh, this morning he met with the NRA. He and Vice President Pence, and following that meeting, the NRA uh, tweeted out that both the uh, POTUS and V POTUS support the Second Amendment. As of recording, we hadn't heard a, a response from the White House, but there kind of goes to your point, mm -hmm. you know. That they had to say that. Whoever he's meeting with is is what we're hearing. Mm -hmm. right. One That's thing it. we have not seen too much of before is the big companies in the country who yeah. have historically sold weapons that are now taking a stand. Dennis, what's happening there with people like Dick Sporting Goods, for example, saying we're not going to sell until you're 21 years old for these assault weapons? You know, I, I don't know if it's just uh, they're trying to be uh, good citizens here in the country or I, I, I'm not sure what 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 where the stems are more if they're just truly concerned about gun violence. I I, I really don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. I think that they have the right to do that and they can make a difference. And you know those are easy things to say. We're not going to sell guns to mm -hmm. you know someone under 21, and we're not going to sell assault rifles at all. You know that's their that's their right to to do. Um, I think it could make a difference. And they are going out on the line because they probably are in a situation they can't win. You know, doing this, they're probably making. Yeah you know, hardcore gun right advocates met. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they're hearing backlash from that. But it is interesting to see the private sector take it on their own. And so far we've seen three come out and it'll be interesting to see if, uh -huh. if more follow. Yeah, Dick Sporting Goods in particular, no assault rifles mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, and that's a, it's a different thing for a company to, to say, I'm not, I'm not gonna sell assault rifles than for some, you know, like, uh, was it Delta, you know, that oh. well, we're not going to associate mm -hmm. with, with, you know, we're not going to give discounts to NRA members anymore. That's that's more exclusive than it is uh, what Dix did. It, mm -hmm. What Dix did feels better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. what's interesting to me, too, and I, I ask this question a lot, and there's not really a, a one silver bullet answer, but this isn't the first mass school shooting right. in the history. It's We've had several of them. So it's so interesting to see that action is coming out of this one when it hadn't in the past. Okay. And I think, to, to their credit, the students from the, the Florida school leading the charge in this are encouraging others to follow suit. And it's very uh, interesting to see that happen. Mm -hmm. Let's get to an, a couple other bills that are in our legislature right now. One I just have to bring up, because it's not there anymore, but it was all of you. Yeah. No longer giving you complete access to members of the legislature on the floor. All right? There's a bill that said, you, 45 minutes, before, before, before. Before. So tell us what this was and then what happened. This. What was the rationale here? Des describe it, well, Glenn. Well, from what I heard, there were complaints of reporters lingering on the House floor with no... Eavesdropping. Yeah, with no... Eavesdropping. Even eavesdropping, yes, <laughs> I've heard that. Winder. Right, with no official business trying to, as Dennis said, eavesdropping to see if they can pick up a story, listen to what lawmakers are, are saying and see if they uh, can run with something there. Those were the reports. Um, however, as we saw... You know that changed drastically by the time the final rule and was. And I, I don't approved. know that I've actually seen anyone eavesdropping or hovering over lawmakers' desks. They're too I, busy. They're writing. Yeah, I mean, you go in, you you do an interview for a few minutes on the floor, and you leave. I I don't uh, understand the the. Uh, the rationale behind yeah, they, it. They kept changing the 45 minutes and then 15 minutes and then five, five minutes. minutes and then so you would see these pictures up on Twitter of even five minutes before session, you know, it's supposed to start, there's still no legislators on mm -hmm. the floor. So it, it, it wouldn't have made a difference. That's not the best place to eavesdrop no. anyway. No. Okay. They're not there. <laughs> no.
to their credit, I have to give them props for listening to what we had to say and really coming up with what I think is a, a fair resolution. Basically that there is no time limit anymore, but we have to be on official business. You know, we have to be talking to someone mm -hmm. when we're actually on the house floor. We can't just be loitering around, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, another access bill was interesting this week that came up, restricting access of state entities, broadly described state entities, from lobbying the legislature. Glenn, I know you followed that first. Let's tell us what that bill was, and then let's talk about why the legislature would want to limit the number of people coming on the Hill. So basically, just as you said, it would have limit, uh, uh, limited state officials, people that are fa uh, paid by the state from lobbying for or against a certain bill. Uh, I think the premise for that was some state entities were maybe bringing an entourage with them and so lawmakers potentially felt that they were you know just being outnumbered uh, in that and they just ended up on a solution where it's down to one person can come and approach them. One designee can yeah. come and approach them. That person them. doesn't, but hell, why? Well, there's this fundamental discomfort that conservatives have with the idea of a state employee lobbying for uh, a state legislature for, you know, something that they, they want or they don't want. But the reality is they don't have lobbyists. They need to be there, you know? So I, I think the fact that it's just limiting it to one is, is better than it could have been. Um, but the hard thing here is that, you know, we have stories just this week about uh, energy solutions and, and how they're a big, huge donor and um, and then how a voting on a bill kind of was, a you know, their, their mm -hmm. fee hike, their fee uh, reduction was affected by who received donations. It's hard to see that, you know, public employees, state employees, they don't have the money. So y you can't limit witnesses, you can't mm. limit hearing testimony from people who don't give you something. You know, you, you have to be open to everyone. I wonder if they're worried about getting mixed messages. I, what's to prevent an employee from one agency to come on one side of the bill, another employee mm -hmm. to come in on the other side of the bill? I, it, to me, it's, almost, it's limiting free speech in a way. I, I think anybody should be able to come up and, and speak their piece to the lawmakers on, on any issue and, and not be limited by the fact that they work for a state agency. Well, and I think they're, I think they're still allowed to come on their own time. Yeah, You but still get to be a private citizen. You can come at 8 Right, you're, you're still going to say, I work <laughs> for this, this agency, right. and, and that's going to carry some weight, regardless if you're saying, I'm, I'm here as a private citizen. Can you imagine a process, though, where the state superintendent, who we... Uh, you know, the the uh, purpose of that job is to do what's right for the state schools, not being able to go and talk to lawmakers about certain bills. That just made no sense mm -hmm. to a lot of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this interesting bill impacting initiatives. You brought up a couple of the initiatives already in the program today. House Bill 471, interesting, essentially puts the pause on any initiative that is voted on by the public for a period of time. Right. Michelle, tell us what this bill does. and. Because it is a pause, right? right? Yeah, no, it stops enforcement until after two months after the next legislative session. Mm. And their their uh, their reasoning was that so that so that they could meet together in session and tweak it if it needed to be tweaked, or you know, they yeah. said practical reasons or you know things like that. But they also admitted that perhaps for political purpose, if they need to tweak it, they need the time to do that before it goes into effect. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, Dennis, it uh, was an interesting quote from our newest legislator, Travis Siegmiller, who said, I'm nervous about the concept of empowering the citizenry to intervene so swiftly. That doesn't go over well. I, I'm nervous about empowering Travis Siegmiller, <laughs> if, if that's the case, you know. I mean, people have a fundamental right to petition the government mm -hmm. to initiate these, uh, these ballot measures if the government's not acting in the way that they think that it should be. And to, to the, our legislature has a history of trying to just constrict the ability to get initiatives on the ballot and get them passed. Yeah, and so this is, this is nothing, nothing new. This is another attempt to, to, to tighten that noose. That's a good point because there's already a strong threshold to get a ballot initiative on the ballot here in the state of Utah compared to, to other states as far as signatures and where they need to come from. It's no easy task to get on the ballot as it is right now. Mm -hmm. Well, l let's understand this, this piece, because the legislature is trying to say sometimes these initiatives may pass a, a law that doesn't 
kind of fit with this? Is it just or a fit? It conflicts with an existing oh. law or, right. or something like that. Right. Yeah, and they want time to be able to sort through that and adjust it accordingly. The danger in is, is that it's possible that they could to tweak the initiative that was passed, and I think uh -huh. that's what the, that the real concern mm -hmm. is. Well, and they could do that anyway, really, and that was their point. Well, we can we can change it anyway, even if we have this or not. Um, but this limits its enactment so that it. Uh, the people aren't invested in it as much because mm -hmm. it hasn't started. They haven't had that right yet. Interesting that it easily passed out of committee. Uh, I mean, I know that's a lower bar than what is on the House floor, but it had the strong support of the committee, but on the very same day, the governor came out and expressed concerns with it, saying, mm -hmm. you know, we can still stay the way it is, let it go into effect, and then you can make your changes to it the following legislative session. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like he may not even sign it if it were to pass anyway. Okay, well that's, that's entirely possible. Do you think this is just a sign of the legislature's concern that we have so many initiatives? Is this now business in Utah? The initiative process, or is this a fluke? The legislators Michelle. do not like the initiative process. They they see it as problematic, and I you know I tend to agree it's not the best way to make law, but it is a way to make law. And they have given, you know, the citizens do have that right, and they need to respect the right. Mm -hmm. All of these situations are issues that the legislature has had in its hands for several years. And those behind them have gotten to the point where they say, all right, enough is enough. We're not going to get it this way. Let's bypass the legislature and take it straight to the people of Utah. Okay. That's going to be the last word on this one. Thank you so much for your very insightful comments. That's it for tonight's show. The conversation continues online at KUED.org slash Hinkley Report. We'll see you next week. Thank you and good night.